Percutane is for me yet no. I, I, I'm still, if I'm going to fix it, I want to make you anatomic. I want to get you as good as I can get you. Right. Another question, Lee, is uh, if you have revised a plate using uh, your lateral approach, deltoid split, and uh, you have to reverse it, you have to revise it to a reverse, would you go through the same approach or would you go delta pectoral? I'd probably go delta pectoral. So, Stiffness following proximal humeral fractures, uh, you, you don't always have to take the metal out, okay? So you can mobilize the subacromial space, you can mobilize the subdeltoid space arthroscopically. And if you have a look sometimes, you'll see that it's not your plate that's abutting onto the chromium. Screen them if you need to, but you need to just mobilize the shoulder. So you can gain 30 degrees of elevation just with an arthroscopic procedure. So what I'll often say to patients, look, I'll try arthroscopically, see what I can get. How much more movement do you need and how much do you think you need your auxiliary nerve? I hate pulling my plate out through my extended anterior lateral when it's tethered to the auxiliary nerve. And so if I have an excuse now to put another skin incision, go delta pectoral and peel it off, I think it's safer for the auxiliary nerve. I don't know. I think it's safer. So I do my reverses through the delta pectoral approach. I know it's going to be a fight, whatever I'm going to do. And so I want a more extensile approach. Okay, so we've got one more question. Uh, with your suture fixation, does it come in the way of screws when you're putting the plate on? Yes, sometimes after you've sutured it together, you'll put your drill in and you'll cut your screws. Um, you can add a few more at the end um, and then put them over the plate or tie them onto the plate. But if you put a one vicral suture um, just to position everything, just to give it some shape, um, you'll be surprised how much you can achieve fixing a proximal humus just with sutures and then offer your plate up to fine tune it, provide a fixed anchor point if you need to, to rotate things or push things away in relation to. Um, but often just most of my fixation is done first with the one bicycle. Okay, thank you very much Lee. And now I think we'll proceed with the next talk on uh, hemiarthroplasty. So the one part. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. And now I think we'll proceed.
Thank you. Hello. I've given myself a short talk on hemiart plastics for fractures, a procedure which is uh, you see that this is a fairly common fracture, more often seen in the elderly, and 80% of these can be managed non operatively. So, coming straight to the point, why do we do a replacement? Now, traditionally, we hemiart plastics. Uh, for fractures were done in the elderly age group, where we know the bone is uh, osteopenic with a high risk of fixation failure. And even if the bone does heal, there is a high risk of AVN. So we want to give them one single procedure and hence the amyotoplasty. This was the gold standard, which has largely been supplanted by our virtual. If less than eight millimeters or a disrupted medial hinge, both are high indicators of AVN and probably would sway your decision towards uh, a hemiarthroplasty. So for a younger patient, the uh, fracture patterns which would probably merit a hemiarthroplasty would be a fracture dislocation, head splitting fractures, uh, impaction fractures involving more than 50% and uh, four part fractures where the risk of ischemia is quite high as we have seen uh, in the previous slide. Now, where is your cutoff, you know, 50, 60? Uh, this is, uh, I think, more of a judgment call, which you will have to decide. Uh, what is important to know that the hemiarthroplasty does uh, preserve the glenoid, and generally they are done in the younger age group now. So 
it is likely that the pre-injury cost status is uh, largely intact. They have a better bone stock, uh, which gives a better chance for the tuberosity to heal and a better rehabilitation potential as well. So when we talk about the poor outcomes of uh, heavy arthroplasty, we've just got to take a step back and uh, see what's going on in literature. They were traditionally done for the elderly age group who have got poor bone stroke, the bone tuberosity does not heal and the rehabilitation potential is uh, quite poor. Whereas the indication has now changed and it's probably time to readdress this. Now, not all four part fractures are the same. Uh, you've got uh, five different uh, pictures here, all uh, four part fractures, but the valgus impacted fracture has a very low incidence of uh, AVN and can quite easily be treated by any other appropriate method of fixation. When it comes to the decision between a hemi and a reverse, uh, I think it's generally accepted that uh, reverse is uh, more predictable and it does not depend on the healing or integration of the tuberosity. If the tuberosity does heal, then obviously the outcomes are going to be even better. On the contrary, the functional results obtained after a hemiarthroplasty are unpredictable and entirely depend on whether the tuberosity integrates. If uh, the tuberosity is malpositioned or gets resorbed, you're likely to have a poor outcome. And unfortunately, over half the tuberosity are due to placement errors. Now, it's not uh, my job to start singing praises of a hemiarthroplasty. I think I'll leave that to Dr. Williams for his next talk. I have to, however, caution you that a reverse arthroplasty is not a benign procedure. It has its own set of problems. You can get scapular notching, instability, acromial fractures. The infection rate is higher. And if you look at literature, there is no strong evidence to suggest uh, the superiority of a reverse over a hemiarthroplasty. So the trend seems to be that uh, it is probably better. Throughout your orthopedic career, you has been hammered into you to restore anatomy and reverse arthroplasty is probably as a non-anatomic procedure as you can carry out. Hemiarthroplasty is not an easy procedure and in my view, it is probably the most difficult arthroplasty you can carry out. It is a technically demanding procedure and the success will depend on a number of variables, including restoring the height, getting the head size right, getting the version correct, getting the tuberosities to heal in the right place. And the irony is that uh, most surgeons who embark on uh, arthroplasties would probably do their first arthroplasty in a fracture scenario. Look at some tuberosity examples. So here's a fracture dislocation where a hemiarthroplasty was done. The tuberosity was nicely restored, went on to heal, and one can predict that the outcome is likely to be good. This is another example where a hemiarthroplasty was done, and over a period of time, you can see that the tuberosity has partially resolved, and the outcome is likely to be satisfactory. Here's a third example with a hemiarthroplasty, and you can see the tuberosity over a period of time has got completely resolved and one can predict with reasonable confidence that the outcome over here is going to be compromised. Now, this was a observation from a study which we have recently carry out, carried out on uh, anterior glenohumeral dislocations with tuberosity fractures. Uh, and what stood out was two fracture patterns of the tuberosity. One where the tuberosity is a big chunk, which is seen in the younger age group, and a second type where the tuberosity is more like mush. So if you were to extrapolate this for uh, hemiarthroplasties, it is likely that in the younger, the tuberosity fragment is large and it has a better potential for healing and hence a better outcome. This is an example of a bilateral posterior fracture dislocation, which had bilateral hemiarthroplasties. On the right side, uh, there's a nice chunk of tuberosity, which if this does integrate, will give a fairly good outcome. Whereas on the left side, the tuberosity appears more mushy and the outcome is likely to be more compromised. There are a number of technical aspects which need to be addressed uh, when doing a hemiarthroplasty and uh, should try to address some of them. So my top five tips. Tip number one, prosthesis selection. We have moved on from the times 
of a monoblock near prosthesis to fracture prosthesis. Now, what I mean by a fracture prosthesis is they have been designed to be modular and in the metaphyseal region, there is space for the bone grafts. So the success, as we have seen with the hemiarthroplasty, depends on the integration of the bone graft. And the arthrogrosity is not going to stick to metal, it's going to rely on the bone grafts for integration. Secondly, if you do use a hemiarthroplasty, use a platform system where if it ever comes to a reverse, uh, to, a, to, a, to a revision procedure, you do not necessarily have to remove the stem. You can change the interface and uh, can convert it uh, to a reverse uh, without too much difficulty. And thirdly, do not overstuff. An overstuffed joint is a recipe for failure. So if you are in between sizes of the humeral head, opt for the smaller humeral head. Here is an example where uh, you've got a hemiarthroplasty with an oversized head, which was recently referred to us. The tuberosity is resolved, the cortex is thin, cement going beyond halfway down the shaft and a well fixed stem. So to revise this would be a logical, night a logical nightmare uh, to get the stem would cause significant bone destruction. Fortunately, in the United Kingdom, we can get information from the operating surgeon of the type of the prosthesis used. And fortunately, this was a platform prosthesis and it wasn't too difficult to revise it to reverse arthroplasty. Tip number two, retroversion. The normal humeral retroversion varies anywhere between five to 50 degrees. And in general, we tend to place a prosthesis in about 30 degrees of retroversion. So what happens if uh, there is excessive retroversion? When you do repair your cuff, the posterior cuff will be under excessive tension. And when you try to internally rotate, the tuberosity is going to pull off. And we have seen that a failed tuberosity equates to a failed hemiarthroplasty. Secondly, uh, if it ever does come to a revision procedure, you do not want uh, your prosthesis to be excessively retroverted or even at 30 degrees. So I think Compromise would be somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees, which is where I tend to place my prosthesis. Tip number three, get your head, get the height right. The number of techniques which will aid you in getting the height, common ones, uh, what we are trying to achieve is uh, to restore this uh, distance, uh, which is about five to eight millimeters from the footprint uh, attachment and uh, of the rotator cuff to the dome of the head. Measuring the metaphyseal length is one of the techniques. So if you measure the metaphyseal length and uh, leave the prosthesis proud by a similar amount, you'll roughly get the height right. But this technique does not work when the metaphysis is significantly comminuted. Another popular method is measuring the distance on the top of uh, the pec major insertion to the dome of the humeral head, which is fairly constant at about 5.6 uh, centimeters. Jigs are cumbersome, something which I have never used or nor have I ever seen them being used. The technique I use is uh, an intraoperative uh, radiograph. So what we are trying to see over here is whether the gothic arch is restored and getting your height right uh, between the tuberosity and the dome of the head. It is a quite an idiot proof uh, procedure and works every time. You can see over here as well another example with the hemiarthroplasty with the restored gothic arch and uh, roughly the height is right as well. Probably the most important tip is the uh, tuberosity osteosynthesis. If you look at the normal anatomy, the lesser tuberosity is attached uh, just anterior to the bicipital sulcus. With the old uh, near type of prosthesis which had a lateral fin, there was a tendency to pull the tuberosity to the lateral fin, and this resulted in over-tensioning the anterior cuff and having a lax posterior cuff, which almost always uh, resulted in loss of external rotation. So the more modern prosthesis have an anterolateral fin, which aids in more anatomic reconstruction of the tuberosities. The way you attach your tuberosities, there are different techniques involved. The one which I use is the one described by Pascal Boileau, which uh, utilizes six sutures and uh, three steps. The suture material I tend to use is uh, something strong like uh, fiber wire or orthocord. 
So first step is uh, getting the tuberosity attached to the stem. And your bone grafts go deep to the tuberosities. As I've mentioned earlier, your tuberosity will not stick to the metal. You need the bone graft to integrate uh, the tuberosities. The second step is getting the tuberosities uh, attached together in a surplage. And finally, the third step would be the tuberosity to the shaft. And your bone grafts will go deep to the tuberosities, which is a crucial step in reconstruction. So here you can see the hemiarthroplasty where the tuberosities have been tacked, the prosthesis is in place, and this is where the bone grafts will go in. And at the end, you should have a good watertight closure and can commence early rehabilitation, which uh, is my tip number five, uh, which would entail putting a poly sling for four weeks, uh, commence elbow mobilization straight away and uh, commence passive and active assisted elevation to 120 degrees and have free range of movement after four weeks. Sometimes special uh, situations uh, require special procedures as uh, seen over here, where there was a shaft fracture with a humeral head fracture. So the outcome of a hemiarthroplasty is uh, usually dependent on the tuberosity integration. Tuberosity malpositions is seen in as many as 50%. Uh, it's either too high, too low, or the tuberosity gets detached or reabsorbed. Over a period of time, one will notice that the chromohumeral distance reduces as the cuff fails, and this will be reflected in the decreasing constant scores as well. The age of the patient uh, we have seen is important uh, since probably in the elderly, the rehabilitation potential is poorer, and hence the poorer outcomes. So you can expect uh, from the uh, systematic study that with the hemiarthroplasty, you will get about 105 degrees of elevation, abduction to about 90 degrees and about 30 degrees of rotation with average constant score just short of 60. This is one of my better outcomes uh, with the hemiarthroplasty. This was a gentleman who was uh, alcohol dependent. He had a non-union of his uh, humeral head on the right side. He broke his uh, left side from which he had a hemiarthroplasty. And uh, he decided that after two days that he had had enough of the sling and would embark on a self-rehabilitation program. And that was his outcome at six weeks with near full elevation and excellent external rotation. So probably the recipe for a successful outcome is a strong dose of alcohol. So this is my philosophy. If you feel that your patient will outlive the prosthesis, carry out a hemiarthroplasty. If you think that the prosthesis will outlive the patient, then go ahead, do a reverse. So take home messages, hemiarthroplasty is a difficult procedure with many variables. And to get an optimal outcome, you need to get the length version and the height right to get the tuberosities to be in the right place, get them to heal, get the soft tissue balancing. It'll give you good pain relief, moderate function, but the strength is poor. The literature in evidence, the evidence for in, in literature is rather poor. So currently in the United Kingdom, there is a multi-center trial going on the PROFA2, which is going to compare uh, reverse with a hemiarthroplasty and hopefully should give us answers in the next few years. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. Modi, you're muted. Mr. Murray, could you unmute yourself, please? Amit, can you unmute yourself?
So there was a question about whether there was uh, uh, the, the bearing uh, to be used for the humeral head. Well, uh, prosthesis uh, have only a metal head. There is no provisions for any pyrocarbon or ceramic at present. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, I think we'll move on to the next uh, presentation, uh, which is uh, on reverse arthroplasty by Dr. Jack Williams. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Anit for inviting me for this very interesting second part of the webinar. I'm going to discuss with you the reverse arthroplasty in fractures. I have no disclosures for this, this, this topic. The last 10 years, I have been in treatment algorithm. There's definitely less hemiarthroplasty used and more orange in the younger and more reverse compared to the it is 13 years, there's a slight preference for reverse versus Haley in Australia. The revision rate is lower in the reverse. In the United States, a large group of patients in Medicare, since 2015, there has been a change more RSA than Haley's. In 2016, even two thirds of reverse versus Haley in proximal humeral fractures. The evasion rate in that group is slightly lower than in Haley arthroplasty. What about the relation with other treatment modalities? Reverse versus conservative. There's only one level one study, and regarding the three and four part fractures, conservative versus reverse. But beware, it's only in patients older than 80 years old. There was no difference in constant score, dash, was and the other scores. What about reverse versus ORIF? There's one level one study comparing three or four part fractures, Amy versus reverse, in a little bit different age group, 65 to 85 years. The constant score was definitely better in the reverse compared to the ORIF, although in the B2 group, not significant. There was slightly less adverse advanced compared to the ORF. What about reverse versus Haley? Large systematic review, uh, 300 reverses, 1,000 Haley arthroplasties. The reverse did better in forward fraction with less in external rotation. The complication rate was two times higher in the reverse, and, but the revision rate was definitely lower compared to the Haley. And that is quite often the Haley, as discussed earlier, if it fails, it might be quite painful, and quite a lot, a lot of them fail due to problems with the tuberosities. What can we expect from a reverse in fractures? Well, in the first series, the surgeons had the idea that you don't need to cough, so you can reject the tuberosities, but there was a high complication rate published by several authors. Since the tuberosities are reattached, there are less complications, and especially also less dislocations if you consider the anatomy. And how important is tuberosity healing? A nice systematic review and meta-analysis from the group of Amarangan in Middleborough, 380 shoulders over 60 years, they compared outcome versus tuberosity healing. Well, in a healed tuberosity, there's better active forward flexion, better active abduction, and better active external rotation and a better constant score. So it makes sense to take care of the tuberosities. Why do tuberosities heal better in reverse? Well, in reverse, the center of rotation is medialized. There is less stress on the tuberosities after reattaching to the prosthesis. And there is also more deltoid contributing to the abduction than the tuberosities. Well, in early abduction, the forced transmission to the humerus is through the deltoid in the reverse. And in the heavy, you need the rotator cuff in the early abduction due to the anatomy. And, and that can explain why in the reverse, the success rate of tuberosity healing is higher. 
a little bit conflicting report from O'Sullivan in, in, in systematic review comparing the healing of tuberosities and the neck shaft angle. And they saw a better healing of the tuberosities in the lower shaft, neck shaft angle. And their theory is that in the 135 degree neck shaft angle, there's better restoration of the native center of rotation, leading to better healing of the tuberosities, which is a little bit in contradiction of the earlier th hypothesis. What about should we operate early or is delay acceptable? This is a systematic review of torture in a large group of patients where they compared acute versus delayed, the four series. The problem is that in all these series, delayed was defined as more than four weeks. But no, none of these series it was discussing exactly at what time period the reverse was placed after the trauma. So if you consider four weeks compared to acute, you can imagine there is no difference in forward traction, clinical score, and the operation rates. Um, one of these series, the acute was comparing, was compared with the and non-union group, hemiarthroplasty and ORF. And I just focus on the non-union and non-union, who are, that are treated conservative for a long term. And you see there is only slight difference in UCLA score, UCL score, a larger difference in ACES and a larger difference in the score, but still much better than failed hemiarthroplasty or failed ORF. So in some patients, it might make sense not to be too aggressive and wait what the effect will be of the conservative treatment. Some tips and tricks, take care of the proper height. If you place it too deep, you will get an unstable joint. For me, there are two important reference points. If the tuberosity is intact, you can use this plane where you reattach temporarily the tuberosity to the shaft, place it at the level of the tuberosity. If it is very comminuted, look to this spike at the medial side. It tells you how much bone is lacking here, and you shouldn't place it too deep, but keep it at the level where the spike is beginning. Very simple tricks, very usable in daily practice. How to fix the tuberosities? The cyclizing fixation is better than suture to prosthesis. Several studies have shown it, both clinical, clinical and biomechanical studies. And you can either use very strong sutures, like number five, 80 bonds, or metal. I prefer sutures metal. If there is a disruption of the metal, it can bother the patient more than a suture. How to do it? Well, place the sutures around the tuberosity and also around the tuberosity here and around the prosthesis, do it double. Use extra sutures for tension band wiring over the tuberosities at the end of the procedure, fixing it to the, uh, to the, uh, to the shaft. And even when you resect the supersponators, it is a very useful tool. Take care not to damage the circumflex arteries. I have seen patients with very nice reconstructed tuberosities, but they were resorbed after time due to necrosis because of the arteries were damaged. So take care of proper placement, not too low through the uh, uh, around the tuberosities. This is a video I borrowed from Pascal Ballot. Here, the supraspinatus is resected, quite straightforward. The biceps is removed, the head is removed. The base plate is placed as low as possible to create also some lengthening and prevent notching. I prefer also cemented prosthesis in especially elderly people with osteoporotic bone, passing the tapes here, passing the tapes also posterior to the larger tuberosity. Here is the suture for the tension band wiring at the end of the procedure. Take care not to place it too deep. I use normally 20 degrees of reversion. Some people use zero degree of reversion, depending if you want to have internal or external rotation in 
after the surgery, after cementing, you reattach the tuberosity in the way I described. First, reduce it, fix the tuberosities with strong wires as shown here. And at the end, there's a, you can close the defect which has been created by removing the supraspinatus. And you see here a nicely constructed, only a small defect, superior and a nice stable shoulder. I will, I'd like to show you two cases. One horrible case, a female 63 years old after a fall, a four fragmented fracture. One week later, the young surgeon decided to place, the young enthusiastic surgeon decided to use a reverse arthroplasty in this case. But if you look to this X-ray, this young lady would be a very good candidate for osteosynthesis, even though there is some osteoporosis, but you could consider a conservative treatment as well. Four weeks postoperatively, there is no bone visible here around the tuberosities. She was referred to me two years later because the shoulder was still very painful and the poor range of motion with only a very low subjective shoulder value. Very low constant score. Consider if you would have treated this conservative, it has been described that you can have a constant score of 60 to 70 in a conservative treatment, even with a null united fracture. But she asked me if I had any option. Well, honestly, I had no options for her. Maybe for the discussion, someone has an idea what to do with this lady, but I could not offer her any better shoulder. The second case, a male, 62 years old, had ORF for a proximal fracture on the right side. They had two surgeries afterwards. A very low constant score of 25. And that was mainly due to the pain. It was very painful. And as you see here, the poor range of motion, poor external rotation, and poor internal rotation. I offered him a reverse arthroplasty, cemented quite some years ago, an older type of the delta prosthesis. One year follow up, constant score was definitely better, although not normal but most important for the patient that he had no more pain. There's a little bit better antifraction, the same internal rotation, a little bit better external rotation. The patient was quite happy. So for this sort of cases, the reverse also can be a very good option. So for me, the conclusion is that the reverse can be an option, but you should be very careful, and especially all the people. Maybe you should try conservative treatment. And if that is still remains painful, even with a null or non-union, consider reverse arthroplasty. For me, the younger patient or older patient with good bone, I still do osteosynthesis. I reserve the heavy arthroplasty for the younger with an irreparable head. And with poor bone density and generally for all patients over 65, then you consider an arthroplasty I nowadays place a reverse arthroplasty. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jack, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we have uh, some questions coming up, but uh, Dr. Williams has not been able to join in as presenter. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Pandey and uh, Mr. Rainsberg to take the questions on his behalf. The first question is uh, a lot many times reverse is used for failed conservative management. What are your results uh, in a trauma sequelae? Lee, would you like to answer that? Do you need to unmute yourself? Could you repeat the question again? So, reverse is often used for failed conservative management. Uh, what are your results of using a reverse in a trauma sequelae situation? Okay, um, I don't, I haven't done a lot of reverses for sequelae of trauma. Um, so, 
You know, I think on average you're going to get elevation to about 120, 130. You probably get a pain score of about two to four. You'll have a good shoulder, but I wouldn't say it's a great shoulder. Um, and so, you know, most times if my patients in their 70s or 80s, they're getting to elevation 120, 130, I'm not going to put a reverse into you. Uh, I've, I've been slow on the uptake on the reverse just because I, I know it can create so much mischief. When it goes well, it goes so well. When it goes wrong, it goes so wrong. And so when my consent is so, I'm conservative. Are your results better with a primary reverse? Would you get more movement? Oof. Ye mm, yes, I think you probably would. Yes. Um, I think for primary reverse versus sequelae reverse, yes, I think you'd you'll get more movement. But you may be do, you may have avoided all the risks and all the mischief of that reverse. So it's a double edged sword for me. I'm sorry. Mr. Pandey, would you like to find on that? Yeah, uh, so I, mean, I don't have a huge series of that, but there is a very nice paper which is being published. I can't quote you the exact paper, but if you Google it, it's, uh, I'm sure you'll find it. When they compared reverses done for osteoarthritis and reverses done for post-trauma sequelae or failed prosthesis, the osteoarthritis ones did a lot better than the post-trauma sequelae, which is quite expected. Uh, but the other problem has been the rate of infection. The the infection rate is a bit high. People are doing a reverse for failed uh, fixation. Infection, infection rate is slightly high, which is quite worrying because there's nothing more depressing than an infected reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Okay, there's a, another question uh, here. How do you go about with the tensioning to get the tensioning right and prevent instability? So, so yeah, 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 go, Mr. Pandy. Well, uh, I mean, Dr. Uh, Williams has shown a very nice way of doing it in the video and in the uh, and in the his slides to see so, so basically you you uh, sorry the question what is the question can you repeat that again sorry I meant. how do you go about with tensioning to prevent instability oh okay how so do you tension your prosthesis you have to repair the tuberosities first that is very important and the you don't want to sink the prosthesis too much. So as Dr. Ja, uh, as Jab showed that you don't want to sink the prosthesis too much. So the the two most important things you can do uh, if you understand the fracture configuration properly, and then uh, tensioning would clearly depend on the spacer you use. Uh, so. If you've done few, you will know how much, uh, but when you reduce it, it, it should go with a slight, slight uh, clunk. Uh, and if it is popping out very easily, then obviously the tensioning is not right. So when you distract the process by pulling on the arm and there is a obvious gap, then obviously you are a bit loose. So actually it is all quite dependent on your experience it's it's not something which can be very well taught but the, in my opinion it's most important is not to sink the prosthesis too much or keep it too proud and make sure the tuberosities are well uh, repaired and in the end you just you know, and if you pull the fracture, there should not be a gap happening uh, some people say this the slope of the of the of the prosthesis you use is also important, but I'm not so sure. And uh, just one final question. Uh, in a fracture scenario, which is your preferred approach, a deltopectoral or a superolateral? Lee, would you like to take that question? If I'm going to fix you, most times I'll do an extended anterior lateral approach, okay? If I'm going to replace you to do a hemiarthroplasty or reverse, 
I'll often do that through my delta pectoral approach. Uh, it's the approach that I use for my elective arthroplasty. Um, and I'm going to take nearly everything out. So if I'm going to fix you, I do an extended anterolateral. If I'm going to do a reverse, I'll do you through a delta pectoral. And getting the tension right, when I first started doing reverses for elective and for trauma, I think I put them in too tight. I was really scared of instability and putting it too tight doesn't make it more stable either. Uh, that does just have to feel right. So a little bit of a struggle, a little bit of a clunk to get it right in there. But if you make it too tight and over distract the deltoid, deltoid's not going to work. They're going to be painful. I do agree. I try and restore my tuberosities. And don't forget for the reverse for trauma, I personally believe, and Yap mentioned it in his video, you need to excise supraspinatus. And it's a heart rendering moment when you excise the tendon that you spend the other half of your days repairing. But you excise supraspinatus and then repair the tuberosities around. I get my tension right because I know I use the Bigliani reverse, um, but I know where it sits on the calcar in a normal patient. And so when I'm putting my reverse for trauma, I have a look how much of that medial calcar has broken away. And if that uh, calcar has just gone to there, I sink my reverse to there, and then I normally just need a zero or plus three poly. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we will go to the case discussions and I hand it over to Mr. Singh. Right. Thank you, Mr. Modi. I hope you can see uh, this presentation. So we are going to the case discussions and uh, I will ask one of the faculties to um, enrich us with their experience. So the first patient is a 61 year old lady who fell in a kitchen. The medical history, she's type two diabetic uh, on tablets and she lives alone. And this is the x-ray that she came in with. Uh, Lee, could I please ask you what would your approach be for this kind of situation? Okay, so I see a series of x-rays, an AP, possibly lateral scapula, possibly apical labic fracture of the proximal humerus showing some comminution of the shaft as it joins onto the head, but overall good alignment. And so in my case, I'd have a discussion with her about the factors that slow down bone healing. Um, we know that diabetes slows down healing, but does good glucose control improve bone healing? Yes, in animal models. So I tell her as far as possible, control your glucose as good as you can. Stop smoking if you can and only use anti-inflammatories if you really need them, although the evidence for the anti-inflammatories is variable. And I'd go non-operative from the start, um, uh, which would include early range of movement. I don't think delaying has an impact on outcome. And if you're going for secondary bone healing, you want the strain, you want the movement to happen at your fracture site while the mediators are there, while the mesenchymal stem cells are there. So I tell her pendulum exercises, probably avoid active abduction till we see signs of union and show her how if she stands and leans forward, she can clean and dry in her armpit. A little, give her the speech, a little bit of movement stimulates healing, too much movement slows it down. Great, uh, thank you. Mr. Pandey, would you, uh, have any different views? How would your approach be for this patient? I mean, please, I mean, from what you tell, the only problem here is the diabetes. She is otherwise fit and well, you are saying? Yeah, she is medically well, just yeah. diabetes, yeah. Yeah, uh, I have got no beef with treating this non-operatively. Uh, it's absolutely fine. Uh, my, my slight worry, uh, is the risk of non-union in two-part fractures is, is a bit unpredictable. And uh, if this does go into non-union, uh, uh, doing a secondary oper uh, operation at a later date may, be, uh, may, may compromise the result. So I might just wear a bit towards fixing this early. Now, I haven't got any major data to back my statement. It's just my bald head tells me that if I fix it now, I might prevent problems later on. Uh, but it, on the other side, if things go wrong with my fixation, it could be a complete disaster. 
so yes, what Lee is saying is absolutely right, but I would just veer towards fixing this fracture purely because I think I might get a more predictable outcome uh, as well. Now you can discuss what kind of fixation you can do, whether you can do nailing or plating. I, either of them is fine, uh, but uh, my my thinking is maybe fix this because there is significant displacement. She's fit and active lady. The risk of non-union is slightly higher in two two part practice, uh, and that's that's my uh, my thinking. Great. Um so it's always uh, difficult to decide what the right way forward is. Nandan, could I just quickly ask you in experience in India, what would your choice of um, management would be for such a patient? Yeah, I'm looking at the X-ray, I feel that there is a pull of the shaft more medially and that discontinuity there, I think will most likely go in for a non-union, especially if you start mobilizing them early because there is a pseudoarthrosis which forms between the two fragments. Um, so I would prefer to fix this, either with a nail or a plate, but plate is more commonly used and more comfortable using it, so I would prefer Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Modi, yes? Yeah, I mean that, yes, I, even my inclination would be to fix this, but before I fix it, I would probably want a CT because I would probably consider a nailing in this uh, situation because that's my only indication for nailing a two-part fracture. So as long as the fracture line is not extending into my entry point, which would be more or less at the dome of the head, I think I would be fairly comfortable nailing this. Okay, um, I think in this situation we ended up putting a plate in there. Um, and I did put some cement as well just for that comminution uh, at the level of the neck. Um, but my thought was again, having seen some non-unions at the neck level, I have become very wary of seeing, trying to avoid those situations. So that was the choice. Um, Nandan, you want to take this case? This is your patient? Yeah, this gentleman is a 72-year-old gentleman who fell at home. He's a very fit gentleman. He does everything himself. He's very independent. No diabetes, but very well controlled. Um, that's the, the x-ray there. So, Mr. Pandey, we'll start off with you. Um, what would you consider, sir? Well, it's a 72-year-old uh, gentleman. Um, the, the fracture looks a bit impacted. So, Obviously, I'll get a CT to see what is happening. And my first feeling is to treat this non-operatively. Uh, oh, That's sorry, CT. you showed me the <laughs> CT now. Uh, is the head is split? Open. Yes. OK. Uh, you know, I will have a discussion with with the patient there are two options here one is non-operative other one is replacement in my books um, and i would if i if i was to do surgery i would do a reverse the uh, tuberosity is quite okay it's not communicated but so you can do a, a hemi also but i would prefer a reverse but i would give him the option of non-operative management purely because the fracture looks a bit impacted to me. So if everything is impacted, we could try non-optimum and I could always do a replacement at a later date. Uh, fixation, of, I'm not so sure. Sorry, in spite of having the head, uh, part of the head impacted and the posterior part of the glenoid? Um, the far right picture. This one here? They, yeah. yeah, you're right. I was not so sure. Yeah, part of the head is out. Uh, yeah, as I said, if I'm going to do an operation, I will definitely go for a replacement, not a fixation. But I still feel I could offer him a non-operative option for a 72-year-old. Depends on how much function he wants. 
Uh, uh, Lee, what are your thoughts? So, this is the one I'm fixing. So the previous <laughs> one, the two-part proximal humeral fracture, where there's a debate whether to fix or not to fix, got into proffer because people didn't know what to do with them and they showed the function at five years was no difference, you know, working the maths. This one, in my mind, never got into proper because this one is, I don't think, ever going to do well. They don't like it when they roll round into varus. They don't like it when the shaft gets medialized. They impinge. They can't get their arm up into abduction. This will unite, and the problem with this is it'll unite with the head tucked at the back, which means he's never going to be able to externally rotate his arm. And to get elevation, you need some external rotation. So with that piece locked out the back, and all that piece will co conglomerate, he will be left with an arm that internally rotates. He can't get it round to his back. Um, he can't come up and out to do anything up there. And at the age of 72, this is the one I think where I want to operate early because again, everything is contracted, everything is medialized. And so if you try to salvage off the system, it's going to be very difficult. The salvage arthroplasty is where everything has collapsed, the AVN gone in, and trying to gain their length at a later date is impossible. They dislocate, they sublux, world of pain. And so for me, I'm operating early, 72 fit and well, nice big tuberosities, really big tuberosity, big piece. And I'm and once I've sawed off the head off the anterior piece, because this is a true head split, isn't it? Not like a head crush in terms yeah. of near classification, but a true head split. Um, I'm doing a hemiarthroplasty on this person, but I'm using a modular stem. So I'm using a stem that gives me the exit option of a reverse five or 10 years from now if I need it. So I'm off offering him, well, always non-operative, you know, um, but uh, I'm offering him surgery. At the age of 72, I'm likely to offer you a hemi, hemi to start uh, with the exit of a reverse in the years to come. We opted for uh, him me itself. Um, the next slide, please. I will do. That's the intro picture, and that's the piece of the head which you can see it's in three bits actually, it was not in two bits. Next slide, uh, that's the hemi. And the um, Yes, this is a modular type of implant where you can actually take out the uh, head. It's a volutus uh, stem, which is a trauma stem. London, my only critique over here would be that uh, the stem which you have chosen, you don't have enough space for bone grafting at the proximal part. Do you not think it is too bulky in the metaphysical area? Yes, it is. It is a bulky one. This was the uh, non-trauma one before the trauma stem came out in evolutus. This was a HA coated uh, top. So the HA coat actually helps holding the tuberosity. You do need to trim the tuberosity a bit to accommodate it there. I do say I do agree that the stem is slightly proud on the uh, in the height wise, I think it has been sunk in a bit more. But the gothic arch is well maintained, so I was happy with that. Okay. If we can, can, I make, carry on. can I make Sorry. a comment? Just on the on the tuberosities in the relationship to the shaft. If you have a look at that head fragment, it's resting on that medial calcar. Um, and the Shenton's line or the Gothic arch is actually good. I don't think, to be honest, you may have been able to sink that stem a little bit more, but not a lot more. And I often find when I'm fixing my tuberosities, particularly with the hemorrhage, I do too much. I pull them down too much. And so I'll often clean my tuberosities when I'm repairing them for the hemiarthroplasty, because my tendency has always been to actually pull the tuberosity down. And I don't know sometimes, is it that the tuberosity, here's your, your head, yeah? I don't know if it's that my tuberosity has been pulled down or is actually rotated a little bit towards the back and whether I need to f bring it, you know what I mean, bring it forward to me a little. But you can't sink this stem much more with the geometry of the fatness there. Yes, yes. I agree. And that point about your tuberosity is pulling down, that's very, very commonly seen because it's we always have the tendency to pull it down rather than we don't pull it forward we tend to pull it down and that is one mistake i make when we do the especially the infraspinatus 
fragment and the terrace fragment you need to get it wrapping round rather than pulling down and that's one uh, thing i always notice with the uh, when you fix the with the hemi arthro plastic or even fixation work okay uh, i think we got uh, time for a couple more cases yeah so a 72 year old gentleman who slipped on ice it's his non dominant shoulder he's got no other uh, major health problems and is neurovascularly okay and he came in with this uh, picture radiographs of uh, ap and a poor quality lateral as we get normally um, mr pande what are your thoughts at this stage um i think this would require surgical intervention firstly uh, if the patient is fit and well um, and i think i am looking at some sort of replacement now i need a bit more detail on the tuberosity but from what i see the tuberosity appears to be comminuted um uh, but if it's not a big chunk of tuberosity i would go for a reverse but if it's a reasonably nice chunk of tuberosity then a hemi may not be a bad idea but i will definitely do a platform system hemi uh, so for me in a 72 year old this fracture uh, i would i would go for some sort of arthroplasty thank you uh, lee um i've got a ct scan here does that help you um does it make any difference to your management um no I, well no i don't think it changes my management it always adds some information and what you see nicely on your ct is we always visualize the valgus impacted forepart that the head has come down but the head has come down and tilted backwards you can see that on your second image so when you elevate that head i'm not fixing this one by the way but if you yeah. are going to fix this one when you elevate the head it's not just pushing it up up but you also need to push it round from the back to allow that tuberosity to fit back into it can you go back one click yep on the plain films the things that really worry me about this is the loss of the medial hinge and no calcar attached to that head fragment and so there's no doubt in my mind that head's dead z that head's dead okay <laughs> You don't need to go back but if you went one back click you mentioned lots of health problems and so <laughs> yeah this is a reverse for me or a nothing because i don't want to subject a 72 year old to potentially two or three operations that's if i'm going to do one an operation i want one operation that's reliable that's going to give him a good outcome and we'll get him to stockholm when i talk about stockholm it's his end point we're finished but in fact I might even say well so if you that frail and that elderly and and uh, uh, don't have an operation because the reverse I do later rather than sort of try and fix it or something like that the reverse I do later will be more difficult yes maybe not as reproducible but you might actually get reasonable function and pain relief so it really depends on how medically and well the patient is the patient patient is quite well actually quite functional just a non <laughs> and i think the thoughts in my head was when he came that the head fragment is displaced and as you say the hinge <clears throat> seems to have been lost and with the risk of avn in a 72 year old um we chose that a replacement was required and luckily the profer to Uh, had restarted despite covid they had restarted and we asked profer to 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 randomize the patient and um the patient was randomized to a reverse so he ended up having a reverse arthroplasty but you know that was lucky harvinder yeah it was pretty lucky you remember this case was <laughs> yeah i was just wondering mr pandey because there there was a big uh, nice gt fragment and the head is valgized i know there is a bit of a shell of a bone but once the head is pushed up and gt is sitting down can we not just do a percutaneous fixation the tuberosity is comminuted and you know the screw which you will put in 
72 year old it will be difficult as, as uh, Lee has rightly said if you look at the medial calca it's quite a significant displacement so that okay. the head is for all practical purposes avascular so in a 72 year old you probably want to do uh, do one surgery so i fixation although you know it always sounds attractive but in this one the likelihood of that failing is very high that's so, great okay i would have gone for a reverse itself but just a question yeah Okay, um, last one, uh, a four-year-old who's quite independent, hypertension is controlled, right hand dominant, she tripped in the garden. Amit, do you want to um, discuss this one? Uh, Mr. Pandey, perhaps? you. Uh, again, here, yeah, the... the the uh, medial calca is reasonable. There is a reasonable humeral head, uh, but the tuberosity is quite displaced, and I think it looks like one big chunk. Uh, 84 independent. One can give them a choice. So that my for me the choice will be do nothing like start early mobilization or do a. Uh, you can do a hemi here, I think, because uh, uh, tuberosity is a nice large piece. But again, given the fashion these days, I will probably go for reverse because that'll be one operation in an 84 year old. Uh, mind you, reverses do have significant complications. So for me, it will be either do nothing or go for a, a, a reverse. If someone wants to fix that, that is absolutely, I, I, I don't I don't have a problem with that. Given that if I had to do surgery, I might do a hemi. And if I'll also get the choice of not doing anything. Okay, uh, Lee, what were your thoughts around this? This so patient. My thoughts, just looking at the plain films, this is a three-part fracture of the proximal humerus. There's a greater tuberosity fragment, there's a shaft fragment, and then there's a head fragment. On your lateral scapular view, your uh, lateral view of the humerus, you can see the outline of the head coming to the outline of the lesser tuberosity. So this is not a really a biology thing in terms of uh, uh, blood supply to the head. This is a little bit of a biology thing with bone quality. If you have a look at the outlines of her shaft of her humerus, she's got little pencils. It's not, she's osteopenic, isn't she? This is going to be a bone holding problem. Yeah. So this is about her really, if she wants, how she feels about one operation or two operations. So if she sits there and she says, yes, Lee, I want a good shoulder. I want my independence back as quickly as I can. Um, I don't mind having surgery, but I only want one operation and I like taking a little bit more risk. She'd get a reverse. But there's a part of me here that thinks I could fix this. I could elevate that head, tuck the greater tuberosity behind, put a plate on there. Would I augment in terms of putting augmented screws or use some bone cement? Um, calcium phosphate sort of injectable cement middle probably a little bit of overkill i going as far as the um so i'd probably offer a fixation plus or minus reverse good okay um so i think this amit uh, discussed with the patient and the patient decided uh, non-operative management this is her x-rays at 10 weeks uh, and this is how she is post-op. I think she <laughs> has done reasonably well. Amit, do you have any comments? How well, did you find this? Well, I think sort of this just re-emphasizes uh, the results of the proper trial really. You know, we had extremes of use right from non-operative to fixation to to all the way to reverse arthroplasty and uh, you know they 
do just as well. I don't know what others' experience have been, but when you have COVID, uh, there has been a bigger shift to treating fractures non-operatively, and I don't think they have done too badly either. I don't know what uh, your experiences are. That's great. I think uh, we come to the end of the meeting. Mr. Modi, you want to take over? Yeah, it looks like. Good, Brendan. Okay. Live. I think I'm just going to hand over to Brendan. Uh, I think if we can continue with it. Yep. Yeah. Hopefully you can all hear me. Hi, yeah, good. Got a thumbs up from Lazy Ears. Um, hi, Ed, guys. My name's Brendan. Um, if you were with us last week, um, you'd have seen me kind of quickly run through the Polaris 3 nailing system. Um, this week, uh, I want to take you through the, the kind of other side of that same system, which is the plates. Now, just one thing kind of to, before I go in with it is to remember that this system um, essentially uses the same instruments and screws as the, the nailing system. So the Polaris 3 isn't just plates or nails, it's a proper fixation system. So let me just switch to my demo camera. Um, so hopefully we can see, there we go, the kind of plates that I've got here. So. Basically, the, the Polaris 3 proximal humeral plates are designed with essentially the medial calcar in mind uh, and really kind of structural support. Um, and obviously, it's been cited in published literature that aiding the prevention of postoperative varus collapse is kind of really beneficial. Um, one of the things that the Polaris plates have is three calcar screws. Um, and the reason for that really is with that um, medial uh, calcar support. So you'll notice that there's two different colour plates as well here. Um, so they are right and left specific, uh, and that is designed really to enhance the placement uh, and to optimise the screw trajectories into um, both the humeral heads uh, and obviously with the posterior tabs um, into the greater tuberosity as well. So this is one of the, the nice little unique features with the, the Polaris 3 system is the, the posterior tabs um, that are optional. Uh, obviously, we do have plates without as well, um, but these optional tabs are, are kind of a unique little feature. And they can either be used um, alongside the screws, um, so the, the blunt 4.3 millimeter screws, which kind of lock into the plate. But if you don't want to use screws, you can kind of use uh, sutures as well, just to kind of tie the, the um, tuberosity on as well. There is obviously other suture holes through the plate, and you'll notice that there's less through our plate than there is with other, some of the other systems, but actually they're designed to have multiple sutures go through them. So although there's maybe slightly less, you can get more sutures actually in um, the, the head of the plate to, to kind of tie the, the head on. So as I mentioned, they are right and left specific because they are essentially designed to, to have an anatomical fit. Um, and come in a range of sizes. So we've got the, the kind of shortest of the sizes here being the four hole. Um, this is the 10 hole, but actually they go all the way up to 22 hole as well. So if there's the, the kind of need to fix the head, but also kind of further down the set, there's obviously a lot of different options um, available for you. Um, as I said, it's a lot of the same instrumentation um, that is there that you use for the nailing system. Um, it's on kind of the, the same trays. So as I said last week, you've got the option of either um, a sharp drill or a blunt drill for these posterior screws, um, just to obviously try and protect the articulating surface on the, the kind of far side of the humeral head. You've got the radiolucent uh, carbon fibre retractors on the set as well. Um, which obviously, you know, trying to, to reduce the fracture and get the plate in the correct placement whilst, um, yeah, getting retractors in, in the, the, uh, the fra fracture site. These are really a very handy kind of piece of kit to have available um, on the set. Um, <clears throat> so really, that's just a, a really quick overview of the, the set. As I said, the, the two main features here are the fact that you have got the the three calcar kind of screws with the superior inclination and the bendable posterior tabs on uh, or kind of optional bendy posterior tabs on the, the Polaris 3 proximal humeral plates. Um, and hopefully you can see kind of on 
the the video there that you have got kind of um, screws going in different trajectories just to try and kind of enable the, the plate to give maximal um, stabilization um, of the humeral heads when this plate. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, any questions with the, the Polaris um, kit? Um, obviously, if you're based in Nesta, Jackson uh, is your, your kind of area manager up that way. Um, but obviously, yeah, wherever you are, um, get in touch with that creator. If you want any more information on the, the Polaris 3 plate, the mail. Yeah, thank you all for attending. Uh, hopefully, you've had a, a kind of really good couple of sessions. Thank you very much, Brendan. So I think with this, we'll conclude this webinar. Thank you for attending and apologies again for uh, the sound issues and the streaming issues we've had. Have a good weekend. Bye. Right. Thanks, thanks, Lee. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brendan. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Mr. Brendan.